All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this afternoon, last day of class. Um, actually, that's, there's an error on that. It says model from Monday. It should say model from Wednesday. Um, but anyway, that's what we had. That's more or less what we had yesterday in class, the idea that um, the ectoderm was the animal pole. We sort of discussed how there was this local BMP signal there. Um, that BMP signal activates a receptor that should have been called the BMP receptor, but it's called the activin receptor. Um, it's a receptor tyrosine kinase, and those are generally pretty good at altering gene expression. The endoderm um, is vegetal pole. It's got its own local signal, nodal. There's a nodal receptor. Um, then at the border, we've got these sort of outcast cells that don't fit in with either, either click, and so they're getting both signals. They get confused, or sort of, they, well, they don't really get confused, but they just know presence of both signals. They should become the mesoderm. So we've got this sort of stacked pancake arrangement, ectoderm on top, mesoderm in the middle, endoderm on the bottom. Then gastrulation occurs, the endoderm gets sucked in, we get this little cavity forming, um, and that's going to be the digestive system. Um, that point where everything sucks in is the back end of the digestive system eventually. Um, and so now we go from, uh, from stacked pancakes to layered onion structure, and there's this segment of the mesoderm that was called the dorsal lip back before, now it's called the notochord. Um, and then this notochord, this part of the mesoderm, releases the signal noggin. The notochord's up along the back here. So you've got here, you know, you got your ecto, um, and then meso, and over here, this is our notochord, and it's releasing the signal noggin, and then endoderm, and then in here's the hole, the gut. Um, by now, the embryo is kind of elongated a little bit, so this is sort of a, a tube. This is a cross-section of our cylinder. Um, the notochord is a, is a tube that extends along there, um, and it releases this signal called noggin, and wherever there's noggin, we get, a, we get a nervous system. Wherever there's not noggin, we get skin. And so we came to the conclusion that, therefore, the default plan for the ectoderm was to be skin, um, and, uh, and, uh, and um, when it gets the, nodal, the noggin signal, then it becomes brain. Any questions about that stuff from yesterday? The whole part forms like the tube, right? Like the hollow part of the tube? Yeah, yeah, the whole embryo sort of, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's a, so I had, I had this drawing that I drew up there yesterday, um, and um, so as, as, as we get into tube, tube zone here, um, so here's what, um, what gastrulation looks like. And then as we sort of elongate out and get into tube land, then we've got, again, um, ectoderm on the outside, um, mesoderm below that, and then endoderm below that. And then there's this little extension that sort of extends out. And, and so then there's this sort of, here's our gut like that. So, so you sort of got tubed out like that. Does that, yeah. And then, and then the notochord is this little thing here. So in cross section, like I drew over there, it just looks like a point, but really it's a, it's a, it's a whole like cord. It's a whole okay. string so thing. So it's not like the gut is just like in the endoderm extending this way. It's going yeah, and eventually, I mean, eventually the gut's a whole, I mean, from, from like here all the way out to the other side, there's, there's is, a, is, a, is a tube, and it ends up convoluted and intestine-shaped and bulges for my stomach and all that business. But yeah, to me, to a first approximation, it's just a hole that eventually is going to run all the way from the back end to the mouth. Yeah. Other questions about this stuff from yesterday? Okay, so you've all had your discussion sections, um, and so in the absence of any signal, no signals at all, what's the ectoderm going to become? What are the ectoderm cells going to become? Who thinks the ectoderm cells become skin with no signal? Who thinks they become brain cells with no signal? All right, yay, the discussion sections worked. Cool. Um, yes, so they become, uh, in the absence of any signal, they become brain. Um, how do we know? Well, how, do you, how do we know that? What was some pieces of evidence that would suggest that? Sure. For the experiment that we read, when you separated the endoderm cells, yeah. um, it formed into the nervous. The ectoderm cells. So, so, yeah, so we had before, 
Do I have my slide from before? No, I don't. I'm going to have to switch PowerPoints again. Um, so we have before um, this, guy, this business here where if we take a chunk of ectoderm and leave it chunked together, it forms skin. And that sort of contributed to our idea that skin is the default. Um, but then if we take those cells, and instead of the ectoderm being a chunk, we separate them out so the cells aren't near each other anymore, and they're not communicating with each other, and they're not building up a high concentration of BMP around one another, then the individual little islands become nervous system tissue. Right? Um, that's one piece of evidence. Um, another piece, actually, um, yeah, so, so uh, and, and that's inconsistent with our model from Monday. The idea, because here we've now not only removed the no noggin signal, in Monday's class, we had some, some various manipulations where we got rid of the notochord, removed the noggin signal, and when we do that, we get rid of the, the, the nervous system. And that sort of led us to think, okay, well, noggin is, is the signal that turns on the brain pathway. But now we're not, getting rid of, we're not really getting rid of just the noggin signal. We're getting rid of all the signals by isolating these cells from any neighbors. When we get rid of all the signals and isolate those cells from any neighbors, then we get nervous system tissues. Um, and so there's, and so then um, that's one piece of evidence. One other piece of evidence um, is uh, so. So I mentioned at, toward the end of class yesterday that this guy Ali Hamatru Bravanlu, um, he, his original idea was that he was going to um, create this uh, this animal that doesn't have functioning active in receptors, and he thought what he was going to see was probably a lot of trouble in the uh, ectoderm, um, but that there's no mesoderm that forms, right? Because the mesoderm only forms at this border point where we're getting both signals. And so if there's no receptor for the BMP uh, signal, then where you should get mesoderm, he hypothesized you would get endoderm instead. That was right, and that's exactly what he found, but that's not what he ended up publishing as his main result. He, what he noticed that surprised him was that this ectoderm all turned into neurons. And, um, and the, the, the measurement that he did is, um, uh, if, you, if, you haven't, if, you're, if you're in the modern bio lab, you've probably done these already, these Western blots. Um, he essentially just looked for proteins. And he found that there are neuron-specific proteins that were expressed throughout the ectoderm. Um, and that surprised him because he thought like everybody else, that the ectoderm defaulted to neuron when there's no signal. If you're going to remove the BMP receptor, remove the active in receptor, that shouldn't all of a sudden make it turn neural. You've removed a signal, and we thought the default with nothing was a signal, uh, was, was skin. Um, one thing that's interesting, if you look at the dates on these papers, so um, Horst Grunz published in 1989, this idea that segregated, segregating um, these cells leads to um, neurons. Um, five years later, Ali Hamatru Bravanlu published, and, and this publication, by the way, is in some journal that is, is not, as, uh, not one of the most highly um, read, um, high-profile, sort of fancy, um, um, exciting journals where the most exciting biological results get published. Um, and in fact, if you read the whole paper, which is up on Blackboard, and you're welcome to do, um, it is a very boring paper. Um, and not because there's anything wrong with the results or anything wrong with the work that was done or even really anything wrong with the interpretations that they did. Um, Horace Gruntz and Lothar Tack did not appreciate in 1989 that they had found a critical piece of evidence that was going to overturn 55 years, 65 years of knowledge about what we thought was going on with ectoderm differentiation, all the way back to, um, to, uh, to Hilda Mangold's work with these um, transplanted dorsal lip experiments. Um, they had, so you all, just by reading this, um, came in and, um, and if last year is any indication, by the, within the first 20 minutes of the discussion, had figured out, without even having to do talk about the active in business, had figured out what was going on. Um, and yet, um, because um, Horace Grunts and Lothar Tack and everybody was so convinced 
that ectoderm defaulted to skin and had learned that for decades and thought about that and, and that, was just, that was just what they knew, they didn't appreciate how revolutionary their results were. Um, and it wasn't until, um, until Ali Hamatri Bravanlu um, found some more results that were even more surprising and he really couldn't make sense of it. And then he went back and he was like, wait, wasn't there this paper five years ago that said this? And so he went back and he, and he, and he figured out what Horace Grunson and Lothar Tack had missed, um, not through really any fault of their own. Scientists just, um, in general, can get stuck thinking about um, um, what we accept as sort of, what, what, you know, what you find in textbooks. And it's been in textbooks for 60 years. It's got to be right. Um, and so, um, and so, uh, and so um, these sort of surprising results and recognizing how surprising those results are um, is, is not... Um, just something that comes easily to anybody, and missing a surprising result doesn't doesn't reflect ba badly on somebody if they miss a, a surprise result. Um, it's um, it's just um, it really actually takes one, one other thing, sort of a side lesson from this, is that it really takes multiple surprising results before you want to overturn something that's in a textbook in the first place. Because there were already a lot of pieces of data that we talked about and a lot that we didn't that seemed to indicate that, that um, the de default was skin. So, you know, it's not a problem here. We really kind of need some multiple surprising results. Um, and, um, and this reminds me of a couple of quotes. One that was in the syllabus, the second one here that was in the syllabus, um, that Critique and critical analysis is not some sort of peripheral feature of science, um, but rather is um, core to its practice, and without it, the construction of reliable knowledge would be impossible. Um, this was in, from an article published in Science Magazine in 2010. Um, and, uh, and the idea that, um, that by critically analyzing our, our research and thinking about not only what um, not, not only thinking about the models and theories that we have, but thinking about the data behind it. Um, and, uh, and the one that is actually even more germane to this discussion is the idea that, um, that the exciting things in science are not when you have a moment where you, where you have Eureka, I figured it out, but really when you see something that just doesn't add up. That's, it's odd. That's weird. Like, why do these disaggregated cells form neurons? They should form skin. Why does block getting rid of this receptor make neurons? It should make skin. And so that's sort of where, um, um, where the new surprises and new excitement can come from. Um, OK, and so in the discussions, um, you probably, actually, I guess before we talk about the discussions, more, um, what questions do people have left over about these papers and these studies and the methods and ideas there? Okay, and so in the discussions, um, you probably came up um, with something along these lines. Um, very sort of minor modification to what we had had from, from Wednesday. Um, in the ectoderm at the animal pole, there's this local BMP signal. It activates the act activin signal. Um, the, new, the new thing that we're adding here is that this BMP signal inhibits the ectoderm cell's default plan of becoming neurons. So it's this peer pressure signal, and they're all peer pressuring each other to not be brains. Um, they're all sort of going down this skin path, and they're all getting pressured by their buddies to become skin together, and not following their heart's desire of being, um, of being brains. Their sort of intrinsic life dream when they were born was to become a neuron, um, but then they got peer pressured into this other path. In the derm, same, you know, there's a lot of excitement going on there, but it gets complicated and we're going to skip over it. Um, but there's this local nodal signal. Again, at the border, you get both signals. These outcast cells, the mesoderm, um, that, uh, that forms at the border. Part of the mesoderm um, sub-differentiates into something called the dorsal lip. Now we're in stacked pancake phase. Then we've got... Um, Gastrulation, the sucking in, forming of the, the beginning of the digestive system, and what used to be the dorsal lip now becomes the notochord, and this notochord releases the signal noggin. Um, and again, the part of the, in, uh, the ectoderm that's getting the noggin signal at the back of the embryo becomes brain. Um, the new thing that we now know, the next new piece of information, is that noggin doesn't have its own receptor. Noggin binds to the activin receptor and blocks it from doing anything. Um, and so 
it is a sort of natural antagonist, a natural blocker that blocks this receptor and gets in the way of this BMP signal. And so the cells that get this block actually are sort of getting not a signal because the signal is being blocked, go back to their original life's goal from when they were a little baby of being brain cells and, and, are, and the peer pressure signal has been turned off and so they become neurons and then the rest of the ectoderm that's not getting this, in, this inhibition is still stuck in this peer pressure mode and becomes skin by the, by the, by the um, active presence of the BMP signal. Uh, Okay, so that's sort of where we are in terms of model. What questions do people have about that? Yeah, sure. So all the cells express both activin um, and the notable. Yeah, and there are lots of, yeah, yeah, they have many, many receptors. But yeah, they've all got the receptors, yeah. Yeah, so, sure. So when does skin form exactly? When does skin form? Um, I mean, it, it begins to form around the same time that the nervous system is forming. Um, there's, it, it, there, there's many series of stages in sort of the, 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 the transition from generic ectoderm that's still in the process of choosing a path to final skin. Um, I mean, I'm not sure what point you'd start calling it skin, per se. Probably not for another couple of weeks. But the cells are already beginning to express skin-like genes and starting to commit themselves to a skin fate at about the stage that we um, have these signals coming in. Yeah. Oh, I meant, I should have rephrased my question. Yeah. Based on the step number five of the class. Y yes. Um, since neurons and things like that is the default, then how exactly does the skin form? Um, because a lot of, so over here, right here we have BMP, plus nodal, or sorry, noggin, BMP plus noggin. And so these cells here in this part of the ectoderm, their active end receptors are blocked, and they're getting no signal. So active end blocked by the noggin, no signal. Everywhere else, we've got BMP, but no noggin. And so everywhere else, the active end receptors are active, and we're turning on the skin pathway. Does that answer that? OK, cool, great. Other questions about that? OK, so one of the things that I really love about this story is that we can go back to the old data from before. So if we go back to Hilda Mangold's data, um, why do we get two nervous systems when we have two dorsal lips and two notochords? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We've got another notochord here, some more noggin being released. And so now in this zone, there's BMP plus noggin in these modified embryos. And so now, no signal going on there. Um, everywhere else along the sides, we're still getting skin. Um, so instead of this, we've got two sources of noggin that are blocking the BMP signal at two distinct parts of the embryo. Back over here, we've got a chunk of ectoderm all by itself. Why do we get skin there? Yeah, there's BMP, no mesoderm, no noggin. So we could, yesterday, there would have been nothing wrong with saying, oh, well, maybe noggin inhibits the BMP, and maybe the BMP is really... That's totally consistent with all the data from yesterday. Why didn't we do that yesterday? Why didn't we come to that conclusion? Sure. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot of other stuff to imagine, right? And there was no need to. We could have this simple idea of, okay, noggin turns on neurons. It fit everything we knew yesterday. Then today comes along, and now we've got some new things that we need to take into account. This fact that, um, this fact that um, disaggregated cells form neural structures. Blocking the active in, uh, receptor turns everything in, all the ectoderm into neurons. Um, and so now... Our, our simple model isn't fitting. 
So now we're in the that's funny stage and we've got to come up with a new model and figure out some new sort of more complicated ideas to consider. Okay, so what questions do people have about that? Um, okay, cool. So, um, so that's uh, really last chance because this is like that's <laughs> that's it for everything I've got to say about that. We just uh, I've got plenty of stuff to talk about for the next twenty minutes, so we're not done here. But but um, I really want to make sure that everyone is has got a good understanding of the old model, why it fit the old data, the new model, why it fits the new data, and the new model and how the new model also works with the old data. So, yes? So the, so the BMP signals, those are just, just all the cells in the ectoderm sending it to each other? Yes, yes. Um, eventually, so yeah, actually another, another sort of side point, BMP stands for bone morphogen protein. Like way, way later on, like in a month from now, when this stops looking like a tube and starts looking like a little baby, some pieces of mesoderm start releasing BMP and that actually makes bone. Um, but right now, at this point in time, only the ectoderm's using BMP. And it just happens that it was first discovered in terms of making bone, so we named it bone morphogen protein. You can sort of imagine maybe if somebody had discovered it in the context of this, we might have called it neural inhibiting protein instead. And then people are like, well, what the heck is neural inhibiting protein doing making bone? But it's, and so a kind of side point of this, and not really central to the whole idea, but a side point of this is that we only have 20, 30,000 genes in our genome. And so we've got to, the, the, these genes, these proteins, these signals get reused over and over again. And in different parts of the body at different stages in development, the same signal can have a different effect. Um, that's not a central point that I'm going to be testing you on, um, but it is kind of interesting to, to be aware of as you're thinking about well, why the heck is this called BMP? What's that all about? Um, if, if, that, if that was lost, as long as you understand this, you're doing well. Yeah, so what are the questions? Yeah, sure. So the cells that become mesoderm, they become that because they get both the signal from the ectoderm and the signal from the ectoderm. Yes. And is it true also that the reason ectoderm cells keep becoming more ectoderm cells is because they, they get a BMP signal? Yeah, so, um, and before gastrulation, the BMP signal really just says ectoderm. And then after gastrulation, the continued presence of BMP pushes it to skin. But if the BMP goes away after gastrulation, then you go down the, back to the default neuron. So yeah. You, so that, that means that, you know, if they, if they become that wouldn't necessarily stop an ectoderm signal from, from a, a new ectoderm, a new cell that was made in the ectoderm region from becoming ectoderm. Yeah, and it would actually end up being neurons, which you need to be ectoderm first before you become a neuron. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what other questions do people have about that? Okay, cool. Um, so uh, a couple quick announcements, reminders. Um, I, we've got nearly everybody on the faculty course evaluations. I think there might still be one person left, um, but, uh, but we've got enough that, that everyone gets a bonus point, so yay, good work. Um, uh, tomorrow, um, as it says over there, you, final exam, two hours to do it. Um, I, I or somebody will be in that room around the corner, 5304, from 8 a.m. until 5.30 p.m. Um, pick your two-hour time slot. The latest you can start is 3.30. The earliest you can start is 8. You get two hours to do it. Um, uh, and then um, today, right after class, Emily's going to hang around for about 40 minutes or so um, to answer more questions if people have more uh, questions, study questions that, that you want. Um, and then also uh, will be available this evening over email as well. Yeah, sure. If we wanted to take, take it not in the you can come at 8, you can come at noon, anytime you want. Pick your two hours. Nope, just show up. Yeah. Okay, so um, last 15 minutes or so, I kind of want to return back to uh, some of these, these core ideas 
um, in biology that we talked about at the very beginning of the semester. Um, and the three core ideas in biology that we discussed at the very beginning of the semester are the central dogma, the idea that DNA codes for RNA and that RNA codes for protein um, and DNA will replicate we, DNA will be copied into a new RNA molecule, and we call that transcription. RNA will be read and translated into a protein. We call that translation. It's accomplished by the ribosome. There are a lot of uh, little like uh, tweaks and twists and turns, and whether it goes in the ER or stays in the cytoplasm or whatever, um, that all goes on with that. But that's kind of one of the, the core ideas in biology. Um, another core idea in biology is that all cells come from other cells, and, um, and we talked on the first day of class how that has some pretty dramatic implications that um, every cell in your body is a molecular machine that's been operating for about three billion years, not a single break that entire time. Lots of cells have died in the last three billion years, but the ones you see now are alive because they've been alive and been dividing for three billion years. Um, and that's true of every bacterial cell that you see, every, uh, or, you know, that you, uh, every, every bacteria that gets you sick, um, any, anything you find that's alive now has been alive for three billion years. Um, and, uh, and then um, we've also talked a lot about evolution and evolutionary fo forces. Um, I wanted to actually, especially in these fir the first and third point, um, bring that back a little bit more and talk about that in the context of um, giraffes, um, which was one of the first topics from this course. Um, and so there are a few questions and ideas um, that you might wonder about. Um, one thing, uh, so, so um, the, and we talked about giraffe fighting at the beginning of the semester. Giraffes actually do actually hug themselves, hug each other with their necks too. They're not just weapons. Um, so this is not like a doctor damage. These are a couple of giraffes giving each other a nice little hug. Um, and uh, and so um, in thinking about um, how do giraffes develop a long neck, um, one question you might ask yourself, especially in the context of development, is how does central dogma, how does transcription and translation affect this development of a long neck? Um, you also might wonder about how communication between cells, another theme, especially in the last week of the course, um, plays into the development of the long neck. Um, and then on a more evolutionary time scale, you might wonder about how sexual selection plays a role into this. Um, and also thinking about on evolutionary time scale, now a slightly different image, um, uh, um, um, how might um, a small initial population, giraffes uh, descended from, giraffes have a common ancestor with a copy, um, and the common ancestor that they have looked more like an okapi than a giraffe and didn't have the long neck. So if we had some small population of ancestral okapi that got isolated from, um, from um, a larger um, population, how might it be that that small population is more likely to have developed this, um, this sort of dramatic uh, difference in trait? Um, so for the next seven minutes or so, um, I want everybody to get back into groups one last time. Um, and uh, we'll, um, let's see, let's, let's everyone go ahead and get into groups. And I'm going to assign each group, I think there should be four groups. I'm going to assign each group one question to talk about. And then we'll come back together as a class and talk about all four of them. So we'll have about seven minutes to do that and then another seven minutes to talk about it all together as a Okay, uh, sounds like people are mostly, um, mostly uh, done here. So um, for a first question, um, central dogma, transcription, translation, what sort of regulation of transcription is going on? What thoughts about that? Yeah, so the, with larger uh, area with um, to the name of the Hox genes are Hox A3, B3, and C3, but that's not something you're going to be tested on. But yeah, the, 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 the Hox genes that specify the neck, maybe they get overexpressed, maybe that um, by itself gives you a longer neck just with a mutation in a few genes. Um, were there other 
ideas or thoughts that you were discussing with that? Yeah, higher levels of expression. So larger zone, maybe higher level, higher um, levels of expression. And so when you're considering levels of expression, what determines what determines how how much protein is being expressed? Um, how, remember about like how we regulate transcription and turn up to turn down the transcription of genes. Anybody else? What, you know, Yeah, transcription factors. So maybe some, maybe some transcription factor that's just upstream of the Hox genes, the one that turns on these Hox genes, maybe that one got changed. Or maybe the regulatory sequence, that's the, the promoter proximal element right before the Hox genes got a little mutated, so it, so it sticks a little bit better to our transcription factor. A lot of different possibilities there. Other questions or comments about that one? Yeah, so maybe whatever is the segment polarity genes that are upstream of the Hox genes, maybe those got a little bit tweaked so that they're a little more active. Um, or maybe the Hox gene itself, its regulatory, um, the, 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 the promoter right in front of it got tweaked so it's a little bit more active, the promoter proximal element. Um, so, yeah, something like that. Um, more RNA, more protein, and so the downstream things that the Hox genes are turning on that say make a neck are more active, and so you get more of a neck, kind of, yeah. Well, not quite fully mechanistic here, but kind of giving a flavor of what might be going on. All right, question two. Um, communication between cells. Which group had that? Was that you all? What, so what did you all have to say about like, communication between cells and how that might play a role? Okay, so evolution, favorable conditions, and then, um, and then um, uh, certain, certain proteins end up getting expressed. And so, um, and so as the organism is developing and figuring out where to put an arm, where to put a leg, where to put a neck, where to put a head, um, how is communication between cells going on with that? Are they just figuring it out all by themselves? Are there some, what, what sort of communications do cells do? Not like, we talked about some specifics with ectoderm and, and neurons, but just sort of in general, what kinds of you know, things happen. Yeah, social signals. So these cells are releasing signals and saying, kind of like, hey, I'm putting an arm here, don't go put another one right next to it kind of thing, or um, that, sort of, that sort of signal going on. And so there, 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 are, there are chemical cues that are being released that, that allow for this. Um, okay, so what about number three, sexual selection? That was the, the group in the middle here. What did you all have to say about that? Males, yeah, they can attract mates. And then um, we also talked at the beginning of class about something else that they do, not just, not just as like a sort of feature for attraction, but um, combat. combat, yeah. So combat, so you know, here they are kissing, but, um, uh, and, and, um, and uh, male giraffes will hug other males and so on, but, um, but males also will, when a female is around, will fight each other with their necks. Um, and um, and the, the longer necked male wins uh, often in those fights. And so that, that sort of promotes this exaggeration of, the, of that feature. Um, okay, and then so our last point here, um, this small initial population, what did you all have to say back in the back about that? What were you thinking about with that? Um, yeah, so, so this idea of genetic drift. So what, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah, so more dramatic changes can happen in these small populations. So, um, so you get kind of faster evolution. And sometimes it's faster evolution that's advantageous. Sometimes disadvantageous things can happen. But 
um, one way or another, you can have you know, one long-necked animal, and by just random chance, that animal could pass its long-necked genes on to most or all of its offspring, and then um, by random chance, those could pass them on disproportionately to their offspring. And in a small population, you can get very quickly, within a few generations, to the point that in that, that all the animals in that population share are, are completely homozygous for some trait that was a very small minority trait just a couple generations ago. And so um, you can have these very rapid evolutionary events that happen driven in part by selection pressures and in part by random chance. But they can be much more dramatic and much more rapid in these small populations. What questions do people have about that or about any of these other points here? Um, okay, so yeah, so last minute reminders. Um, FCs, good work. We got, them, we got, I think everyone filled those out. Um, final exam, show up anytime you want tomorrow um, between 8 and 5.30. Um, uh, again, last, latest time to start is 5.30 because I'm leaving at 5.30, so, so, so you got to be done by then. Um, uh, uh, um, review session this, afternoon, uh, this evening in just a few minutes. Um, uh, Emily will be sticking around for a little while. And finally, thanks everybody for the semester, and I hope uh, you had as much fun as I did. And I will see you all tomorrow for the exam.